obviously a new, I had a new coach or a coach. I hadn't had one since I was an age group actually, so a decade. Um, so there's change of stimulus. Usually it's positive for people and the training was great. And then race day, I was left feeling like uh, I literally couldn't ride through a paper bag. Um, and even in the water, I felt weird in the chest. And you, you come away when something doesn't go well. And, you know, it's not the first time I've ended up on the side of a road, but you come away from them. You've got to look for a reason. Like you can't, it's very hard just to put it down to a bad day when in training, for me as an athlete, I can perform well on bad days. And that's what, and really that's what training training is about. You train yourself to still perform to a certain level. It's very, it never gets easier. When you, when mm. you pull the pin on an event, it's, uh, you know, whether or not you worry about what people think or I, I'm not in the sport for, I guess, the, it's very personal for me, right? What I'm trying to achieve. And, um, and so I know when it's, it's way off, you know, it's, I, I guess as, as pro athletes, we have a lot of, um, you have a lot of bad races that you finish and then you have events where you're like, I don't know what went, what, what is going on with me or, and you also got, you got to, you need to become robust where you move on from quickly, um, and look for another opportunity. But over the last few years, there's just been a lot of, a lot of inconsistency for me coming out of COVID and it's fine to blame that or, and whatnot, but yeah. after Port Macquarie and, you know, having, having a coach and saying, you know, you're in shape to go very well. Um, I know, you, you know, as an athlete, if you're moving well, but having someone else in your corner saying, yep, you know, you've got to back yourself through the whole way now. Uh, riding solo is what I've done, whether it be coming from 10 minutes back or a few minutes back and, and I, I'm happy to ride alone. Um, in a race yeah. so and that's your probably that's your strongest leg is the bike like yeah yeah and that's where stuff yeah. always seems to go the wrong way for me um like i haven't really i've probably rode to my capacity once or twice in in a full distance race in a half distance i have a few times um still nothing to what i do in training right so right um you know the the talk about a lot of these europeans and, and stuff what they're doing on the bike it's it's pretty yeah, it's okay. Um, not not to try and you know, uh, you know what the numbers are, and I have mates who ride at a professional level, world tour level, and you know I know what our summers look like. So it do, it doesn't scare me to ride to that sort of effort. But yeah, since Port Macquarie was on the side of the road, and then okay, I'll push on to Cairns. It's must have just been one of those days, and which you know you have a lot of them, and they starts to wear thin, wear your patience thin, especially not being twenty five anymore. You know, you, your time isn't forever in a sport or in a part in life. So, sure. Cairns, uh, the Port Macquarie to Cairns training was the most difficult training period of my time in the sport. Um, I struggled with, and, and I guess I, I probably see humor in it now, <laughs> but I got the training done, but I had aches in my ankles, in my knees, in my wrists. I couldn't pick my son up in the morning because um, I had to warm my wrists up. I couldn't get out of pool. I couldn't use pool deck to get out of the pool. I had to go to the stairs uh, <laughs> and, and get myself out of the pool. Um, and that's probably never happened to you. No, no, no. So yeah. I was waking up in the morning and my shoulders were so painful. I had to carry my elbows um, until I could get enough blood flow. And so... You know, I just thought it got very cold in Perth very quickly. And I was like, it must be change of weather conditions, just having an impact. And I'm, you know, very fatigued from the training load. And But yeah, I, did, I had this, it was like 40K, ended up being a 40K run and my ankles gave me grief from the start to the finish. So it wasn't like I was, it was warming up at all. From like my body wasn't warming up. I got to Cairns thinking it was you know, my sports doctor and physio were like, oh, if it's if it's underlying arthritis, when you get to the warmth, it gets better. And I got to Cairns and it got worse. So then I had to okay. load up on Panadol Osteo because I anti-inflammatories yep. weren't working for me. So I load up on that. Um, and it gave me enough to null the pain for race day, but I had no turnover in the water. So it was, I had to let the swim go um, after 
been in a good position for a lap, I just can't maintain that that turnover. And uh, so it wasn't out of lack of of swim effort or loading because the the training had actually been almost swim favoured for for six, seven weeks. So I was, again, I'd worked through so much pain in the water that I knew in training that I knew I could at least swing my arms around. And then uh, I got on the bike and all this tightness from my glutes and, you know, Cairns does it to a lot of people because it's so warm. You need to be somewhat super fresh or been just been living in some some form of warmth. It wasn't ridiculous, but conditions yeah. eventually got the better of me. Um, I was cramping in T2. Uh, my adductors, I needed the volunteer to help me straighten my legs out. And then it just the run was, yeah, you get to the end. And the, the hardest part for me is a year and a half ago, I won an Ironman, my first one. And then I was getting messages from a lot of lovely people after Cairns congratulating me on my effort. And for me, I had, it was probably as bad a day as I could hope for. Um, it does make it tricky then to say thank you because you need to. These people It's, it's are, a weird concept, yeah. isn't it, as an, as an athlete? Because you're just, I, I want to win. Anything other than winning is unacceptable in my eyes. Yeah. I, like even for me now, I've, I've, if I perform well, I know I'll put myself in it. So, yeah. You know, I'm running so I've gone through in three hours fifteen, I'm getting people like oh, great work, you know, you walked in New Zealand, so it's some progression and I, it's very hard when you're running hundred plus K a week in training always and then you just dribble along it. You know, I I, mean, I shouldn't say dribble, right? So a lot of people it's a lifelong goal to run that speed. But we need to run two forty. Relative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's re- you know, it's yeah. not three fifteen isn't yeah. even really Yeah. It's like mid tier for, for mm. you guys. Like it, oh. it's not a it's not a even a very quick time. Like you've nah. got to be sub three. Hundred percent. Like even sub threes, two fifties are now becoming like yeah okay you faded on the yeah. marathon and it's like um, that's the reality of it. And I've been I was an age grouper for three years, so I understand. I'm taking nothing away from everybody. Would go to the capacity they need to. Our capacity is you got to run sub two forty. Not saying yeah. I was gonna. You know, Braden was exceptional, but it's like, well, I underperformed. This is personal. Um, so, I, yeah, I've come home and I, I don't have a rest over summer because I've got friends home, so it's enjoyable to train. So yeah. I rest now. I rest after Cairns. Um, unless I, you know, I wasn't going to the Northern Hemisphere this year, even though I did take my spot to Nice. But since being home, I've, I've spent a fair bit of time with the doctors and it turns out that like as of a few days ago, I have been diagnosed with an underlying like autoimmune disease, which um, it's an arthritic uh, autoimmune disease, which I was told by the rheumatologist not to Google uh, the images of um, what like it's it's it is quite common. A lot of people possess the gene, but it's it's genetic, right? So it's the fault of my parents or beyond. Um, but movement is the number one medicine. So over okay. the years, I've been able to mask it from sure. so much movement because it affects the spine. But that's where predominantly all my issues have been through the SIJ, spinal, uh, lumbar spine. And then it has a lot of other secondary. So it's like primary core, primary issues, secondary issues are larger joint uh, inflammation and then gut irritation, which is, yeah, I've, I've, you know, everybody, I think in, in endurance sport, especially endurance running, guts are very susceptible to to change, and you know you're creating a lot of acid and and rubbish that your your stomach doesn't like. So no one's stomach's perfect, but I've learned to you learn to deal with it, and then that's the whole thing is that you you have to train your gut. Like people think that's a, yeah. a joke, but it's like that yeah. you have to train on what you want to have for race day and build it up. Yeah, and if you want to. You can't just go and take on 120 grams of carbs in the hour when you've maybe only touched 70 in training. You'll end up being sick. Yeah. It's like 100%. There's some real simple science to the nutrition side of it as well, but but it's very complex at the same time. So anyway, this you have to go through a process now to you can gain medication for this. Um, I don't like the word disease, but that's it's a yeah. anaclizing spondylitis is what it's called. It sounds dramatic. I'm fine. Um, so kind of, so why is it, if anything, your training has gone up over the years Mm. 
Yeah. So why, if movement masks it, why mm. now, like you're sort of peaking as an athlete, mm. is it, it's, it's showing its face now? The, could they give, could you give you an answer or? Yeah, it's just the time. Um, like it develops, it's, I guess there's been now, it was quite amazing. Like I, I love, I guess the ability to, I think this sport in particular, you get to surround yourself with a lot of intelligent people in other, um, you know, medicine, you know, body medicine, anatomical medicines, or, um, uh, where you get to learn a lot in the process, right? Cause we're our mm-hmm. own subject, right? We don't have a huge team of people day to day sitting there at the dinner table with us. It's usually our partner or so these people are the ones you rely on. And it was re- very interesting where rheumatologist was going back through times and, you know, have you felt this before and have you felt this and moments of, you know, times of fatigue that you have no reason to be. Hmm. And do you not like to rest now? I hate taper, right? I always have. And it's so difficult because it's necessary. I'm not saying to anybody, you know, don't, what I'm doing here, don't take, don't do this at home. But um, it turns out this, me doing, only doing an hour on a bike and, and not doing much, you know, race week is really quite bad for what this disorder does, this disease does to your spine. It tightens up the spine too much and therefore the ramifications are everything else likes to do the same thing. Or So anytime I've raced well, it's typically at home, right? I've only, mm. I feel I've only really raced well at home. So I well, you broke the do, course, the, the bike yeah. record last year. Like, yeah, no, by a notable amount. And I had issues. I still stopped at special needs and, and, uh, and took time out of T2 with a, some busted clothing. But it's, I always do more when I'm at home because I have the comforts of just, my own environment. So I always do, you know, race week might be 20 odd hours prior to the race. Whereas I go away and I, yeah. Yeah. I like if I gravitate around 35 to 40 is typical 20 feels like I've barely scratched the surface. So I'm not doing excessive amounts of effort or anything like that. I just, yeah. But what I've, what I've done there is being able to keep my spine and my body limber enough to perform sure whereas it doesn't mean now i'm going to go and try and like have these massive weeks but that's what was always confusing for me i would put in i would be 40 hours into a week and go to a a local time trial and push 410 420 watts for an hour and we'll come away like geez you know that's a good ride today and then you're riding home but it would then it would always puzzle me why i go to an to a race and i'm like lucky to see 300 it's like yeah a, right yeah you know i always come up it's always a long flight home to perth and i just got to scratch you know it's it's miserable every time <laughs> it's not like i do i'm not like i enjoy not not performing and not going well and you know i sure as sure as hell know my uh those close to me my my parents and my family they we didn't come from triathlon we haven't come from those from this sport and i've just pursued something that where I thought I felt and I still feel I can perform very high and, and well at because um, it's all about being robust, right? But yeah, now it's like, I guess a different, it's been, yeah, it's been very interesting. I still got to learn a bit about it and, you know, but this apparently the medication will allow my spine to relax and, and my stomach to ease and who knows. But then, but then the next big race is Buster. Well, I suppose that's probably almost ideal because you'll, like you said, you have home home field, like in terms of your own environment and whatnot. But you're in so much control of being able to test different things leading in. Yeah, absolutely. Because the beauty of you know uh, of it is you can go off it if it's not work. So it's not like I have to change my life based on it or change the way I train. I can still train as hard as I want now and and build towards it, but. I guess now going to an race, I can, everyone around you and, and the coach and sports uh, and people in sports medicine, I get to a race and like, oh, mate, put your feet up, just chill out. I will when I've done enough now. <laughs> when, I feel, when I feel comfortable with how much I've done, I'm not going to go out there and two days before, you know, ride two hours at threshold. It's just, 
and that's what people take the wrong way. It's like I'm I'm okay to do time because you know I've I, I've seen things over 15 years where you know even in Kona last year I had such a good training period prior to going, and then in Kona in the heat I just adapted really quickly, mm. and then race week I rest you know, I taper into the event and then I get on the bike, you know, even in the water, I'd swim four minutes quicker from the test swim the week before, four minutes slower in the rain, the Ironman. And, uh, you know, it's all like, oh yeah, it's race, race nerves and stuff, but I quite enjoy that nervous energy. Um, yep. And it's, you got to come away from it and, and process it and, you know, oh, maybe I'll just pull, call it a day. That's, I'm at an eight. At, I'm at a time. Age is just a number, right? I'm at a time in sure. my career where maybe it's just times up, right? You could go that way, or you could say, uh-huh. "Oh well, I'm still. I started at twenty, so you know, it still feels very fresh for me. It's very enjoyable. I love training. I, I never. Okay, the training between Port Macquarie and Cairns was a real battle, but there was other stuff going on. But I love every aspect of of what training demands, what it requires from people around you. I love the organization of, of training. Um, you know, and I, I wouldn't be scared to try anything, but racing is what matters for a sport where you're driven by personal identity, I guess, like you're, you're getting sponsors or you're getting support from events and whatnot based on your results sheet and your ability to promote yourself. Um, you know, so it's a bit, it makes it busy, but anybody in any industry has, you know, a number of different things they need to tick off to engage with their audience, right? And it's just... You and know, I think just, what you just hit on the head there is be pretty universal across most sports, even though the mm. training you do is, or just let's say ultra endurance sports in general is quite high. Yep. When you listen to professional footy players boxers, you know, whoever, the first thing they say is, I didn't want to train. <laughs> mm. And that's the, that's when things start to fall apart for them. Yeah, yeah that's when pretty much their career is in, when they're like, I just don't yeah. want to get on the, get out of bed in the morning. You know, yeah, or- they can mask it for a year or two based on talent or, you know, just muscle memory conditioning, but mm. eventually like they get caught out. Yeah, yeah my, my wife often asks me now, do you still enjoy it? And it is a good question. It's like asking someone, are you okay? You know, it's like, do you, because if you don't enjoy it, you don't have to do it. There's there's a real reality, you know, it's even, I I don't, I guess I don't coach as a, as a business. I I coach as another form of stimulus to, you know, take, not distract me from the sport, but probably educates me a little bit. And for sure, it it aids with patience, Matty, Uh, (laughs) you know, but, but it's a, it's an important aspect for anybody who's getting involved in a sport that just requires so much of your time. You know, you can't to, to complete an Ironman. If you want to not walk it, you need to, and you know, you want to ride the whole thing. There's, you, there's shortcuts you can't take to, to get to the end. Um, and you know the sports evolved so much, and now a short period of time. There was that my probably my first ten years was yeah just a slow progression, but these last five years it's gone crazy. You know from an aerodynamics point of view, to it's a bit out of control at the moment with what people are trying to do to the front ends. But you kind of hope that some rules come into place like they are doing with the shoes now. Um, yep. Otherwise, the bikes will just start to look a bit stupid, and what people are putting on themselves on the bike, you know. Yeah, it's getting out there, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I've got a mate who's multiple-time national champ, TT champ, and he'd come home in the summer. And mate, he'd be on a chain that's like a year old and tires mm-hmm. that he probably hasn't checked for 12 months either. And he would mm-hmm. still put us all the way by big, mate, like minutes. So it's yep. like gear's one thing, but then at the end of it, what's a what's? Like... If you're, you know, like I still firmly believe that if you can put out more power for a long period of time, you will, you know, and everyone talks watts per kilo, but we put so much stuff on our bikes now. It's like those, the real small intricate parts, you know, they matter a lot on the track when you go on 60K an hour, but 
there's very few races where we're above 45k an hour average, right? You know, there's mm. not many. The other week we saw it in Roth break 45k an hour, but it's not like, you know, there's periods at 50k an hour for maybe if you get a tail and whatnot, but yeah, yeah. Still, it's very, I would say to any age group, but don't get sucked into that, the tech side of it until you're riding 45. Um, it's, um, it's, it's triathlon and again, specifically sort of as we get further in endurance, it's, I don't know another sport like it that is so tech <laughs> where, where it's a selling point. Like I mean, the, I've the seen, market's got to sell, uh, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a year into the sport. So Bustleton last year was my first Ironman. Yeah. Um, and I saw the week leading in, I saw age groupers who were staying in our hotel, like doing lactate, mm. um, <laughs> had multiple, like, yeah, you know, half a dozen wearables. Um, yeah, I was just, a lot of them I, around now. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just, yeah. I couldn't understand. I, I coached myself for it. I was just like, I'm just going to work it out. Like, I learned about, I, I taught myself zone two, you know, just like all the mm. basics. But um, I was just, I, I couldn't comprehend that these athletes who, they're not even, and I don't want to sound disrespectful, but they're not even at the top of their age group. They're, they're very, like, they're probably knocking out maybe their first Ironman, maybe two or, th- two or three in. But, you know, they're still learning the sport. But they had thousands and thousands of dollars worth of gear. Yeah, yeah. I- it's it's hard to be critical because, like, it might. Yeah, there's still that aspect of you know no BS, right? I think if if anybody watched the PTO race when Maxi Newman won, yeah, and he got on the mic after and he's like, you know, simple approach, and they didn't like some of his language, but it's like that's still a huge element to it, right? It's like it's. Yeah, we can talk about all all this cool tech, and it is cool. Like some of the feedback is really is really impressive, and you know there is a science behind everything that we do. But essentially, it's still if you can do more at higher effort than the next person, you're gonna eventually be better than them. Genetics plays a little part, but definitely not as big a part in ultra endurance, right? So lactic threshold doesn't impact the speeds and pace we're going at and the power we're going at, right? That's what, there's there's the misconception with all this lactic testing is that's great, but race day, you really won't near that. Or you shouldn't like, you know, mine, for instance, my lactic threshold on the bike's 450 and it's like, you know, you rarely, yeah, you're I'm, not, not I'm not producing it, right? And they even run running, it's below sort of three minute pace and you're not, yeah. And that would be sort of, That'd be for anybody. So it's all relative too. So you'll only run to your capacity. And yep. in a marathon, when you're running off the bike, like it's significantly slower than if you were running a fresh marathon, right? So of it's, course, yeah. Yeah, I think people just need to, if, if, if anyone's concerned about that, should I be doing it? Should, should I not be? No, just consistently train. If you consistently train for a long period of time and stay, don't get injured, mm-hmm. you will improve. Yeah. Yeah, periods I think that's of, a ma- off periods is what puts you back. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a massive thing is everyone yeah. thinks they need, like you said, like a, the, the best bike. They need mm. the, the carbon plated shoes. They need to have their all their wearables, doing lactate testing, all, you know, all, all the things when mm. really like if you just trained consistently for six months, you would be better. Carbon plated shoes change the game. From a oh, massive, yeah. From our, our sport engine, for instance, my lactic threshold on the bike's four fifty, and it's like, you know, you rarely, yeah, you're I'm not, not I'm not producing it right, and they even run running, it's below sort of three minute pace, and you're not, yeah, and that would be sort of that'd be for anybody, so it's all relative too. So you'll only run to your capacity, and yep. in a marathon when you're running off the bike, like it's significantly slower than if you were running a fresh marathon, right? So it's, of course, yeah. Yeah, I think people just need to. If, if if anyone's concerned about that, should I be doing it? Should should I not be? No, just consistently train. If you consistently train for a long period of time, don't get injured. Mm-hmm. You will improve. Yeah, yeah. Periods I think that's off, a ma- off periods is what puts you back. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a massive thing. Is everyone yeah. thinks they need, like you said, like a, 
the, the best bike. They need mm. the the carbon plated shoes. They need to have their all their wearables, doing lactate testing, all, you know, all, all the things when mm. really like if you just trained consistently for six months, you would be better. Carbon plated shoes changed the game from a, from our, our sport in general, as well as, you know, when that phased in, so did a lot of the bike tech too, right? So the thing is, it's so well marketed. Well, like these companies have made so much money because they're fantastic marketing teams, right? They developed the shoe in order, they, they pretty much sold a shoe based on a, a creating a euphoria to breaking two, right? And then yeah. everyone else had to take part in this, but there's always going to be a negative to a positive, right? So it's like carbon shoes are very good for performance, but unfortunately they require someone to run it really with a certain biomechanics and also yeah. at a certain speed. And there, there, there becomes a point where like the curve goes the other way and they're actually going to make you slower. <laughs> really? Yeah, like the the shoes lack the stability to carry you if you're not running efficiently, right? Sure. You know, so it's, we haven't gone and seen records. You know, yes, they've got faster. Marathons have got quicker and there's more people running faster. But we haven't seen huge, you know, drops in the overall speeds of, of marathons and um, compared to when they were running without carbon shoes, right? This is that big level. So, Yeah, so to say yeah. that, is that just because elite level guys like to run a minute quicker mm. if you're running a 220 marathon to run a 219 like mm. that's an astronomical drop yeah in absolutely. terms of effort yeah but like for me as a age mm. grouper like i off the bike i want to run like a 340 maybe mm-hmm. like 330 mm-hmm. would be a dream run yeah so yeah i mean it's the shoes are made to run on the forefoot right so if there's any heel component to to the foot strike, the carbon slash foam interaction isn't as effective. Um, and then because then as soon as there's any heel heel strike or heel time on ground or more ground contact time, which is slower you run, the more ground contact time for each foot, the, uh, the more your stabilizers have to be active. Right, and so if the shoe doesn't have the support, which the performance shoes don't have the support, like a, which all the other, you know, the supportive shoes, I guess. Yep. It's just going to fatigue other muscles. Um, you know, the mass movers a little bit more. But when you're running well, I don't know. I think a lot of people say when you're running well and you've got that freedom of a a real nice leg swing, you could probably run fast in everything. All right. Yeah, yes, sure. you then run faster in the in the performance shoe, in the carbon plated shoe, but they're also lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, so your foot carry is, you know, feels amazing too. Yep. Right. But I, I, I just feel if a lot of people went back to, you know, when they were using a racer, you know, when they weren't carbon plated, they probably had a a more even marathon, um, because you also. Yes, there's free speed in the carbon shoe, but there's it's give and take, right? There's been a lot more stress fractures pop up. Um, so I've noticed force, that if I haven't worn them yeah. for a month or two and I put them on to do a to a speed session, I'm mm. like, these hurt my feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, it takes a while to forces. takes a while to get used to it. There's other forces other than ground contact, right? And you're not you're not the sole operator of the knee drive. You know, the carbon does does play a role and by all means they they're a faster shoe if you're in a faster shape you know it's and and that's never going to be marketed um i'm not with a shoe, uh, shoe brand at the moment so i can't get in trouble but um you know it's it, it's all the market is is there for companies to sell products so they need to they're not going to say oh but if you run slower than four minute pace this may have an adverse effect on your back half of sense or, but it'd be an interesting study. I mean, it'd be a hard study to do because yeah, I don't know how there'd be so many controllables involved, but um, yeah. the, uh, I, I just think people should, you know, you could deem it on heart rate because these shoes also drop your heart rate, right? But then they, yeah, right. yeah, the performance shoes, they make you, because mm-hmm. the cause of the cushioning, you run at a lower yeah. heart rate. It's like running on a treadmill. You lower run heart. You run at a lower heart rate. 
because yep. it's soft to softer surface underneath you. And then the carbon obviously reacts and you propel forward. You feel amazing. Like when you when the foot shoe bounces off the ground, like Oh yeah. You know, uh, mentally as well. Just go with it. That that but, was my next question is how much mm. do you think the plus <laughs> and I don't know how much it would affect you as a professional athlete, mm. but just knowing that you have the right gear or what is mm. perceived or marketed to be the right gear, I wonder how much that plays an effect. Like if you're running in carbon plated shoes and you see the person next to you running in non carbon plated shoes, does that make you feel better so you perform better? Mm. Or does, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting controllable. Yeah, it's, I mean, I still, I haven't run a whole lot quicker in car. I mean, I have. 10k and 5k I run quicker in, in carbon shoes but those distances are suited to that because you're right up on the on the toes essentially but not a whole lot quicker a um, couple of seconds a k but then the marathon like was uh, what have I 246 was in bus it was as quick as I've run when the vapors first came came about and then uh, yeah I haven't my back end but, but I mean that's other reasons not like my my legs weren't breaking down terribly it's just I think once you find the balance with the with everything, then you're better off. Um, but yeah, I mean, see, you could talk about the shoes all day, and everyone's going to have their own opinions, right? And the shoe com- the shoe companies will also have their opinion, um, which is sell the shoe, sell the shoes. You know, it's like, you know, and they often look nicer too. You know, well done to them. You know, Nike. Yeah, they Nike. always come out the crazy, like the Alpha yeah. Flies. How they've got the yeah, I've got the Alpha the Flies, and I, yeah, yeah, I think. They 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 look awesome, but also mm. like, I, I am I am aware that they have designed this shoe to look more. I don't want to say faster, but look 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 more advanced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it looks. Yeah. Uh, people see it. People who may not be into running see it. They're like, well, what are they? Yeah, you what know, the it's like when that? you yeah. pull up to a coffee shop with a TT bike. Someone always makes yeah. you feel good because like, they're always like, "What? It's like a spaceship." Yeah, <laughs> and they kind of are now. Um, yeah, they're going that way. Yeah, yeah, hundred hmm. percent. So let's go back to hmm. the start of your triathlon journey. Like, how'd you get into the sport? Let's go through. Let's go through it. Yeah, oh, I had a um, a friend buy me. I was twenty one. I turned twenty one, and I had a mate buy me an entry to a triathlon. Bit of a joke. I was just into fitness at the time, and um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Australia Day, Australia Day try. I've actually done it every year since bar one because I wasn't well. Um, but I did the novice event this year. Right? It was like 200 swim, 7K ride, 2K run on a borrowed bike that was like a size small. Um, it was her dad's bike. So, um, yeah, no idea. And then I just remember finishing and at the time when you're in the – when you a lot of young guys get obsessed with the gym and I was in that state i was yeah just turned 21 and the thing is you get to a point when you're lifting so much weight and trying to get so big that the the next step is do you go try and do something on stage and that didn't interest me so then i was like enjoying like making workouts harder and this is before the crossfit time so hey crossfit had been around you know or that that style of training it might have been a whole different story for me but she bought she was like what you know do this and i was like nah nah I don't have a bike and stuff. You look for the excuses. And then yeah. I did and also you're probably it. allergic to cardio at that point. Yeah, I did a bit of running. I did some of the like city to surfs for fun. And I don't know, I did like that. Uh, okay. I enjoy training alone. So I, I yep. played footy and cricket growing up. But um, yeah, I wasn't getting, wasn't enjoying them as much. And then when I come out, I didn't swim, right? So I had to breaststroke it. But when I came out of the water and you had to run to the bike, it's still this thought I have like is post race there's those transition and I was like this is like a real test of fitness this is in a lot of aspects and I that whole summer I just did all this little ones all these novice distance events and then a couple of sprints by the end and then fortunately I had a mate at the time who got involved at the same race right different friend not the one that bought me the entry but he was like oh why don't we do the uh, Basso half it was in May at the time and uh, I was like, oh, yeah, righto. And we just trained uh, when we could together. Um, suffered terribly, right? I, I went, I don't, uh, I might have just broken five hours, like 4.59. And uh, and then I was like, oh, he's like, oh, 
what do you reckon we do the Ironman? This is after the race. Ah, oh, yeah, why not? You're 21. There's no, nothing. Yeah, bulletproof, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was like, but I'll, I'll get a coach. And then he used the same program. Um, and it, I really enjoyed that training. It was just 20 weeks, just a consistent build. There wasn't a lot. There's probably wasn't a lot that I actually hit. I just did all the time and all the distances. And I didn't, like no power meter. Um, I was using heart rate and cadence. I was still using, I'd had a bike, but I was on a, a borrowed bike that was too small. I now know it's too small for me. Back then, I just enjoyed riding it. And I would go out like five, six hours on this bike and just, you know, tick this time off. And uh, I went in the bus that year, I went like 9.40. Uh, but I finished second in the 18 to 24. Uh, and then and then someone was like, oh, I'll go to roll down. I was like, I had no idea about this, right? And uh, anyway, the guy took it. And then he was the one that was like, well, oh, mate, you should just try. Port Macquarie was in the, Port Ma- Ironman Australia was in March at that time. So I, I t- just contacted this coach afterwards and I'm like, um, oh, I'm just, gonna, can I train to Macquarie? And he was like, oh, you know, it's pretty soon after your first one, but yeah, I'll send you a program. And uh, and won my age group there by, won the age group by a half hour. I just wow. had this ability to bike when I had no idea about cycling. Like so I the had, second you got on a bike as an adult, you were like, this is my thing. Yeah, in Busso, that first one I rode like, 456 or 457 and it's this is back when this is 15 years ago sub five was pretty quick yeah when you as an I age can't grouper, do sub five yeah yeah when you as an age grouper yeah yeah as an age grouper it was like gee good ride and then um yeah and then over in port macquarie was, the course is hard right so i don't i don't really remember the times to be honest i just remember running and chewing this guy's ear off um who was running the same sort of speed as me and then, yeah, qualifying, my dad and my now wife, girlfriend at the time was there. And uh, we we're going to Hawaii. That was cool. So that was, you know, we we're going to tick this off. And my parents at the time, like I tried to be a professional golfer, tennis player, uh, cricket. Uh, so this is just another one of those times. Yep. I went to Hawaii. So same coach, trained through winter. You go to Hawaii 10 days early, which and a lot of Aussies, you know, you know, I've watched it over the years. They go with such high hopes to Kona, but no conditions in Australia compare. And training in heat chambers and putting all your sessions into locked rooms and whatnot, it takes away from your ability to to attain a certain fitness level. So if there's anyone okay. listening that's going to Kona, put your fitness first. Use use saunas and stuff for a bit of heat adaption, but time in the location is the most beneficial. Sure. But when you get there, don't overcook it. So it's that balance, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the first and 10 step, days out, you, you, you're you not touch. really going to get any fitness. Nah, you're just going to get a bit more, bit, a bit of acclimation. Yeah. And that's when the tours all sort of start that time out from the race and it's expensive, right? Especially back then it was equilibrium. I was, we were a dollar to a dollar. Now it's 65 cents or 70 cents, whatever it is. And so it's, you know, I'm still, we're still recovering from last year when I, you know, I went for five weeks and yeah, I don't even want to add up the numbers, but I just suffered like the swim. I suffered. I, everything felt so intense. And I come back to mm-hmm. come home and I was like, oh, I want to go back there and do it properly. Now at the time when I first started triathlon, I was probably a hundred, just over a hundred kilo. I was, when I started lifting weights, I was obsessed, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, all the stuff. You're tall. How tall are you? You're like six, yeah. two. Yeah. Six, two. So, yep. um, yeah, I was just like 102 sort of kilo. Um, mm-hmm. Just, but love like love leg day. There was no skipping leg day either. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and then by the time I went to Kona that next year, I was like 90 or maybe 90, 91, 92. So I melted right, and then I come over to Busso and I'm like, I'm going to go and do Busso again. So I done four, did four Ironman in my first 12 months, and I qualified again um, to go back. Right, so the progression I went like, you know, a year later I went nine forty busso. So you you must have known just there, like it must have been given your sports background. There must <laughs> have been something in your head where you were just like, oh, I could be all right at this. So you, was, know, you went sub, you went sub ten like instantly. Yeah, some and, people train their whole, some people train their whole life and don't get a sniff of it. Yeah, and I just just 
not taken away from this bed, but I just was jogging. I felt like I wasn't, I did because it was 40 degrees in Busso the first time I did it. It was the hottest day I've raced in Busso. Um, and I was like, gee, I might not finish. Like, and I just was within myself all day. The best race you can have as an age grouper is if you don't over rev, right? You just, you race within your ability all day because you'll be even start to finish. Um, and then your bad races start when you overcommit, right? When your uh, sure. ambition is greater than your ability. But um, yep. yeah, and then so <laughs> I, I requalified for the following year, you mm-hmm. know, still 18 to 24. And I was like, righto, now I'll just not do another Ironman until then. Like I'll just do Kona. Like I've done four in my first year. I'll just do, wait till next October. Yep. And then I did a bunch of halves over the first part of that second year in the sport. And mm-hmm. I was winning the age group and the first age grouper in in Australia at the 70. There was a lot of 70.3s then. Like this is 2011. Yeah, 2011. So there was, you know, Yapoon, Canberra. Oh, where else were we going? Like, I don't know. There just seemed to be a lot more, ha- lot more races going on, right? Um, smaller regional ones. And then, um, yeah, I would have done four, three or four maybe. And then I went to Kona four weeks early. And uh, over that over that winter, though, I, I set myself like a pre-season where I was like, okay, I'm going to lose weight in a controlled effort. But then it becomes an obsession, if that makes mm. sense. So I went from literally like 90 to 80 and oh, I must have been two and a half, three months. Um, you know, and then I was in Kona and then I'm dipping below 80. So I'm, you know, 78, which is sort of what I get around at now. That's 12 years ago, right? 10, you know? So that's, I, I changed too much of my life in that time. Like I, it puts a lot of pressure on home life, right? Okay. I was, still living, I was still living mum and dad at the time, but no one wants to be around someone who's hungry all the time. Um, yeah. And I, and I didn't, and, you, don't, you don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, oh, the thing I've learned speaking to pro athletes is they all have this obsessive mindset. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you're, if you're in your head decided like I'm dropping 10 kilos or I'm just going to get leaner. How have you, how have you worded it mentally? Like mm-hmm. there's, that's all you're thinking about and nothing is getting in the way. Yeah. Yeah. I just measured food and where you go and you, again, another learning process, but the difference, eh. I don't know. I was still. I just wanted to go well in Kona because um, it felt like it had it sort of defeated me the year before. And then, yeah, I went four weeks early, trained with a few Aussie guys there, and uh, which was cool. They were there early too. And then I did win the eighteen to twenty four um, that year in twenty eleven. So age group world champion. So it was fantastic. But I suffered at one hundred and fifty k on the bike. I literally was seeing the road move right. So I'd got a power meter for the first time before I went across and I only put it on in Kona and I was like, okay, so everyone rides 300. So I'll just ride. This is what pros ride. I'll ride 300 watts. Do you know, I just want you to know how crazy that is. Yeah. I rode it to 110 though. <laughs> you know, I hadn't used no, a power no, meter before. So just, yeah. but just the fact that you're still, you're, you're two years into the sport, you're, <laughs> You have never used a power meter and you just go, oh, the pros ride 300, so I'll do it. Regardless yeah. of hmm. your legs falling off at 110 kilometers, <laughs> like I couldn't run, I couldn't ride at 300 for an extended period, longer than a few minutes, hmm. you know? Like, yeah, and that's where there is a, endurance can be developed, right? And I and I will be the first to say I, I probably rarely missed a session in 15 years, but it it also needs capacity, from a genetic point of view, um, that definitely helps, right? And, you know, I only had a background in, you know, pushing weights. That was that was it. But I, I had a capacity to run, say, playing footy. I was not fast, but I could run for a long time. And that had developed over time. Um, I was useless at school. So, um, yeah, then I, so that, I remember riding, riding back along the highway in uh, the Queen K and I was just grabbing like, bananas at aid stations i was like no i'm not going to be able to run i've made a mess of this but as a lot of people hear this story a lot and i got off the bike and i was actually running pretty well yeah and i ran one my age group by maybe 10 minutes maybe eight minutes um 
you know, but you all suffer on the back, on the way back. So, but it didn't matter. I, I got there, I achieved something I wanted to, and then you automatically qualify for the to go again for your age group. Typically, everyone's like, oh, well, you should turn pro now. But I was way back. It was the year Maca won that first one, uh, his second race. And I was like, I'm still an hour behind him or something. So I was like, nah, I'm way off and I swim terribly still, which, you know, that's not improved much. But it actually has. It actually has. My first Ironman, I swam 106 or 107. And now I swim 50 minutes there. So uh, that's improved. But um, yeah, and then the next year I was like, well, I need to do an Ironman to prepare this time. That's what I hadn't done from Busso to Kona. So I was like, I'll do Melbourne first time. It was the first one in Melbourne. And I'll race that age group. And then I got, you know, at this time in my last year as an age group, I was winning events in Australia. I was the first age group by a significant amount, right? So I was trying to go faster, you know, beat myself each time. Sure. And then... Um, and did you know, to... going into those races, did you know, like, I'm I'm going to be in the top sort of one, two, three age group athletes, or were you just like still just going to see how this goes? As an age, I, you learn. I had a really good coach at the time where it was never about who I was racing. He was very just straight up and down, and that's still the way I train. I guess just no no bullshit. Um, just worry about you, and that was I was progressing. Pretty well after it, yep. Um, and yeah, I guess I was enjoying – like I tried a lot in a lot of other sports, but I was enjoying the success of – I was putting effort in and I was getting reward back, so um, in the shape of small trophies, right? Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I went to Melbourne, got really bad uh, food poisoning two days before. Still tried to check my bike in. We had to pull the bus. You had to take it to Frankston. We pulled the bus over on the way back because I was still being sick. This is the afternoon before. And, and you know, my dad's with me. Like, oh, you're right. We'll just try to have a burger tonight. <laughs> like, I was so... This is as crook as I've ever been. It was from both ends, right? Anyway, yeah. at the time, Urban Hotels was sponsoring the events. So Ricky Jeffs, who was the director, he was like, oh, mate, we'll give you an entry for Port Macquarie. Don't worry. And then I went to Port Macquarie and... I might have just broken nine hours, but I won. I was the first age gripper by a fair walk. It's not quick now, right? So don't take time. But at the time, it was I was moving pretty well. Yep. And I was like, okay, I ticked the nine man off, you know, because Port Melbourne was March and then Port Macquarie was in the May then. And then, uh, yeah, then I just did some 70.3s and again went to Kona a month early. Um, the year before, I'd actually done, the first time I went to Kona and won my age group, I actually got to Kona and went and did, flew over to Vegas and did the 70.3 World Champs. And I was only, I think I was fourth in, in the 18 to 24. But that was a cool cool trip, cool experience, very fast trip. I was on my own. So, um, but yeah, that was super hot. I, it was cool to experience. And because I, I wasn't ready for the heat yet anyway. But yeah, that second year I went across and I just executed the third year in Kona, sorry, three years in a row. Um, I executed the race better. So it's when PJ won mm-hmm. in 2012. And I, I didn't break nine, but I was like nine oh, real low. But I was a second age grouper. I got beaten by a guy in his late 40s, a German fella. Um, mm-hmm. But I just rode consistently well. Like I didn't fall apart. I'd, I'd educated myself a little bit more as to what where my levels were at. I'd actually started working with, uh, I guess, our waste cycling coaches back home and got involved and understood cycling a bit more and perhaps where my strength laid and how to to do to ride that better. And then I reckon at the time I, could, I wouldn't run my, – my fresh marathon time probably wouldn't have been a whole lot quicker than what I was running off the bike. Like I was just so strong that I was able to maintain a good run off the bike at the time and it's not till later you learn about running and you know educate yourself in different ways and to how to perform fresh and and off the bike and what you need to do but for me at the time I was just about all off the bike right so yeah I I ran low threes and um and I was 30 minutes 40 minutes behind PJ I was like 30th in Kona that year Mm -hmm. as yeah second age grouper 
overall, but win win my eighteen to twenty four again. So then, really, it was I turned pro, and I reckon that's when I needed a coach <laughs> at that time. Yeah, to say like, yeah, but just chill and don't try and do forty hours straight away because it just unraveled for for twelve months. I was like, wow, I'm just so far off the mark when. You know, I was going to races and I was finishing in the top five in some of the, some of the Aussie ones. and um, But it's, it was a different dynamic, right? Age group to you, you, age group, you don't worry about others. When you race pro, you do. It's tactical, right? There's, there's different things at play. Most people come to a race in pretty good nick. Um, yeah, and then by the end of my first year pro, I had a good race in Bustleton. So I rode through, come off behind Jeremy Jerkowitz, won that year. And I finished six in the end, but it was just better overall effort from me. And, and what like, do you oh, think okay. the what do you think the biggest difference was in that first year of going pro? Like, was it just the tactical side? Like, did you feel mm. did you feel like you were because you're, you're such a strong rider? Did you feel mm. like oh, I can hang with these guys? I'm a bit behind in the swim. I'm a, such a good rider. Like, it sort of balances out, and the run just sort of is what it is. Or do you feel out of your depth? Like, yeah. I just was swimming real poorly at the time that, and then I was trying to force the bike so much. Whereas, like any good athlete, they always seem to be having fun, right? They always seem to be enjoying themselves and they're going well. So it took me a year just to settle. I I reckon find find my feet, you know. And I was twenty four and still thought I was invincible, but like I didn't race a whole whole heat that first year. I did a tried a couple of events but um yeah nothing really it's also a weird a weird sport in terms of when you when you turn pro in almost any other sport you can almost compete to your heart's content like if you're if you're a martial artist or a boxer like you can book a fight every three months if you're a footy Mm -hmm. player you get a whole season so you get minimum 20 games cricket season you can play in australia you can play over in england Mm. if you're good enough Mm-hmm. Um, but for Iron Man, like you've got the two or three races, and you, go, you know you can chuck in some seventy point threes as well. But you just don't have the you just don't have the volume of races to get comfortable. Mate, it's my biggest issue with what we do now is you don't get another chance the next weekend. So that's why it's so difficult to get on a plane and go home and. That's what that's what wears thin. It's very unique in that it's not You've next weekend. You've got six weekend. months now before you compete again. Yeah, you know, it's like, and you, there's other events along the way, but it always has to be the long term focus, right? Which is the main focus. But now I kind of feel like everything's just training. Like, yes, you focus on events, but then after that event, there's always another one, right? There's another focus point or key and it's like I've made that many mistakes <laughs> that as an age group I never did I just progressed well very well but I did mm, I just also wasn't overthinking it like I ran 117 a couple of times as an age grouper and then I barely bloody stripe strike through at that at the moment and it's like you know I yet I'm so much better runner so it's like Oh, you know, people, easy to say you're suited to the Ironman distance and stuff, but you know, what I know I can do over two hours on a bike, it should should be putting me to the front every single time. It's I'm not performing to that. To, it just makes me angry. You know? So yeah, it's fine to be having fun when you're doing something, but you can also get very frustrated. So yeah, yes and no. It's just like, I know, each to their own. If, you know, a lot of people want to turn pro. Just make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, mm. Don't do it just to be able to post up that you're pro athlete. Um, you know, it's 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 a long road. It doesn't. You can have a short rise to fame and then a <coughs> come crashing down for eight years. But all I wanted to do the whole time was get back to Kona and race it as a pro. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I spent. Then, uh, when I went well in that bus in 2013, then I went and won like a, a race here at home, a half distance in the January, went to the Philippines, the Challenge Philippines, the first inaugural running, it was Asia Pacific Champs. Yep. Maka was there, Greg Bennett, <coughs> excuse me, Mac, um, 
You're right. It was quite a big field. They got across there. It was good money. Mm-hmm. And I won it without, like, it was a very hard course, right? And no one knew the course. It was in the jungle. Um, but, yeah, I just rode it like a bike race. And it was really lumpy, um, quite quite long climbs through it. And, uh, and, then, and then the run would just suit me. It was more of a strength run. So I come over from that. And then I was on the front page of a magazine. And I was going to Taiwan to do a challenge there. And it was the first time I had some issues with my back. I had some spasms through my back really early on the bike. But then it flipped me into a vicious spiral of tent playing with my equipment all the time. But whether or not that was actually what was causing the more irritation or it's the fact that I was actually suffering from something that I didn't know about, um, which wasn't overly symptomatic. So it wasn't like debilitating. It was just frustrating. And, you know, everyone deals with a sore back or a stiff back at times, but mine's every day. So, you know, at the age of 25, it's odd to, to go through it. But there's also people in worse situations. So it could always be worse, you know. You know, I live with, a, I've got a family that's very much about that. So, you know, you appreciate what you've got and <laughs> who you've got around you. But, yeah, nothing really fell for ages. You know, I travelled to see specialists and, and stuff for like four or five years. Time, you can look at it now as like time I'll never get back, but probably my most educational time of my life in terms of what you learn about the human body and about your own body. And, you know, I made some great friends over that time because I was still racing. And the only thing that kept me in it was I'd have these little periods of like, oh, that was a good race or, yep. you, know, you know, yes, I've podium there or something. And then I, and then there was always someone after a race, my old man or my, my mother-in-law would speak for it. Like, I will support you. Keep pushing, keep pushing. <laughs> um, you know, when I was like, no, I went to Europe in 2015 for the first time, 2016. And when I come home, I was like, that's it. I, I pushed the trip a bit longer and I missed my cousin's wedding. And I had to pull out of it. Yeah, yeah, I trained and, and, and raced. So I've become very good friends with uh, Mike Phillips, a Kiwi fella. Um, yeah, we just got to know one another race in the Philippines. And we travel together heaps now and, and spent some really good periods in Europe and you know, he's seen me just lay around because I couldn't walk for a couple of week period. And, you know, you just make it when you're away, you just got to try and make it work, right? The, the, the expense has been paid. So, um, you know, but he probably kept me in it at times as well. So I'm not saying it was, they were bad times. They were just very challenging, unique times, I guess. Um, you just want things to, yeah, you want that reward for effort. And I, I just wanted to get back to Kona to do it once. And it took until 2019 to qualify and then so 20 end of 2018 i i had to have time off at the start of 20 2018 uh yes so the start of 2018 i had to have six months off it was like 2017 2018 so i'd been to europe i come home in 2017 and i was on the side of the road in another race there and I was like, oh, that's done. Anyway, I went over to Melbourne and saw a guy who was like, no, no, you just need to work on some uh, spinal movements, which I probably did for my spinal health um, based on what it is. So, But I also had a huge fracture in my sacrum, which was, I wasn't symptomatic. I could still run 100K a week without any problem, but I did have issues at times, right? And so um, I had six months off where I just swum and believe me, if you just do that and you just swim 40 or 50K a week, you do swim better. But then you bring, bring when you bring everything else back in, um, then you slow down. So, yeah, my wife and I did the um, the Rotto swim, a famous channel swim here as a duo. Oh, yeah, which yeah the be, Brotness which is, Island one, yeah. Yeah, which is nice to tell our son and, and family one day um, that we ticked it off as, as a duo. And then mm-hmm. by mid-2018, I was back on a bike and I went to a race in the Philippines. I've been on a TT bike for two weeks and it went exactly how I thought it would. <laughs> but then th- three weeks later, four weeks later, I did a race in the Bintan and I was on the podium. So 
I was like, gee, that's that's an improvement already. And then I progressed to Bustledon that year in 2018. And I just, I won a challenge Malaysia. It was a half distance. I progressed and I was just consistent through to Busso and I was racing quite well. Mm-hmm. And then I was third at Busso to Terenzo and Cam Worth. And so I missed the spot to Kona by one. And then it's the spot to Kona by one. And then the next March, I went to New Zealand and I raced Wanaka and Taupo. And I missed, oh, I was a podium in Wanaka and then Taupo, I missed by two spots. I finished fourth. That's when Mike ran 240 um, in, in New Zealand that day and, and won the race. And then, then I went to Cairns and I finished fourth. I missed by a spot. Um, I broke down on the run there. And then I went to Europe again for a period. And I tried one more time in Sweden and I ended up on the side of the road. My my back was quite average. And I was like, oh, no, I thought I've got rid of all this. But then I went and seen another specialist. I came back to Australia and my mother-in-law was like, no, nah, just prepare for Busso. I'll help you. Um, but I went and saw a specialist first and tried some other stuff in, uh, in Melbourne. Yeah, and I felt a lot better. And then I prepared for Busso, and that's when I went 7.55 to Brownlee. He went 7.45, um, but I qualified. And then, uh, yeah, early 2020, I was podium in Wanaka again, and then fifth at Ironman in Geelong, and 7.3, and then COVID hit that three weeks later. And then I was at home for two years. So what's going for you? Like, that, <laughs> that's, all, that's, that's a... A big stint, yeah. You know, we're talking sort of five mm-hmm. or six years from where the back problem started. What's going through your head, mindset wise? In, like, because you're having when you put it together, obviously, you're putting it together at a high level. So, you're just getting almost it's almost just a tease that you're like, there mm-hmm. it is, like, there's the light. And then all of a sudden, you're done. And then you're building back up, building back up. You get this bit of relief, and you're like, yes, fuck, here we go. And then bang, yep. gone again. It's the worst thing for it was like little glimpses of uh, success or performance. If I just had been shit all the time for like 12 months, I probably would have packed it in then and done, you know, I I don't want to be the dependent for my wife forever. You know, that's the reality with the sport we do. We're not on contracts like, you know, mates that come home and, they ride for world tour teams and stuff. It, you're getting a weekly salary. It's, it's handy and you can put yourself out there socially a lot and you get a lot of product. But in Australia, we don't have this, we don't attract the same uh, media as what they do in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So the, the brands don't need to pay the money that they do up there. And yeah, so you got to make, do you shift up there or, you know, do you move up, move to here? But it's like, no, well, they don't move to here, right? this is home for us. So we should be able to enjoy it and be with our family. It's important for me. Family is extremely important. And I missed a cousin's wedding. And that's one of my biggest regrets in the sport. It's like the day of her wedding, I was sitting on the side of the road in Barcelona because I'd had to pull out of a race there with the, the issues in my back. And that's where you're like, ah, oh, you know, you don't get those opportunities again. <laughs> you know, well, I hope not for her. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's you know, now. Now I have a son. Where I would love to be in the sport now long enough where he remembers, mm. you know. But for the for the short term, I, I got to Kona. I went to Utah and I didn't finish either of them. And again, issues that I was still scratch my head a little bit about now. But you live and learn. Um, yeah, sure. But I want to go back to Kona and I don't care. I don't care what the finish number is as long as I perform to where I feel my potential is. Yeah. I don't have to exceed it. I'm not, you know, I've, uh, the loose dreams are gone. You know, the, I, I just want to make, I just want to fulfill a reality to my abilities. Um, you know, because I know they'll be fairly good. You know, without it's not it's not an arrogance thing when you see the data every day and you see what you can do, you are aware of what's capable and what you should be able to produce on a on a good day. You know, I go to a race, say I'm going to have a good day. That'll put me around somewhere, 
And it's like, if you have a really good day, then you'll be in it, right in it. You know? mm. And when you say ride, or oh, when you say race to your potential, do mm. you mean, is that, is that an intrinsic thing? Like you don't, not putting a number on it. You just want to know you left it all out there. Or is that like a, it needs to be a, a this time. Cause I know that mm. is a hundred percent what I'm capable of. I would have said that once being more database, but now it's, it's about the, the way you execute the event, right? So swimming your freshest, right? So you just get through that. You try and find the bunch. It's, <coughs> it's not as much in your control, but when you get on the bike, if you can evenly ride something at a high effort, you've had a, a good ride. Like Basso last year, I was holding back the last 40 or 50 K because I was like, oh, I'm in unknown territory here in terms of, you know, to go the quickest side road in Basso is a 412 and now I'm 405 territory. Um, it's like, I've always believed if there's one race I could break four, it's there. But I'm going to go and do it before that, like before the, the race day. Because you need to, riding is something you need to do prior. Running, maybe not. Because that's all very dependent on a lot of factors, right? The, you know, running is so dependent on the ambient temp and, you know, everything needs to align. But riding, there's usually a number. And mm -hmm. if you ride to that at a certain cadence, you can almost hit the mark. Like there's an app, there's that app, best, bestbikesplit.com or the website. They're pretty close to the mark with their algorithm, right? If you input all the data right. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, and that's not as taxing as going down there and say, okay, I'm going to go and run off and try and run 235 here. It's like you, you then take two weeks to recover from yeah. if you try and do it off the bike. Whereas you can go down there, you can go to a course and ride 180, that's it, the whole effort, and you'll recover quick. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like you can see what's necessary. And I've gone down a few times and I knew I was able to ride sub two for a lap because I've done it. I've done it three or four times now and it's like mm -hmm. it's with traffic. So... You know, I think the course this year will be a little bit quicker because it will flow through town better. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that'd be that'd be special. But I'll be worried more about how I'm riding and my position I'm riding um, because I know what what's will equate to speed down there. You know, it's it's yeah. a huge advantage. It's why the French will be so good in Nice, um, knowing that terrain, knowing that descent line. Um, because that's what everybody's forgetting and you hear in these discussions about people in France using road bikes and stuff like we don't climb like cyclists, right? They attack climbs five to six watts a kilo. People will still be riding tempo up the climb. So you'll be sitting up and people will be right, you know, you can't afford to over rev on the climb. It's like you won't because you won't recover on the descent. You've already used too many matches and you've got to run later. So it's... Yeah, it's sort of a race where you almost need to chill on the climb to a certain degree because it'll obviously when you climb, the power comes to you, right? Climbing's if you're in training, if you need to do efforts on the bike and you need to hit a wattage and then you're feeling a bit off, usually you go to an uphill because then it's easier to hit them, right? Because yeah, the, sure. the power's coming to you. So, but if you're able to commit on the descent on those sort of courses, that's where you'll take the most gain and then ride the down, ride the flat segments like. That's where I did Emberman one year, which is a big ultra distance race in France where it's, what do they do, two, 210K or 205? Anyway, it's, it's five and a half thousand meters of climbing, right? And I was coming off some back stuff. Uh, so I had my road bike over there and I did the race on the road bike. I lost so much time through the valleys. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah. I rode, you know, I'd done Elk Duez try a few weeks, a month prior or something it was. And I rode past the front group. You know, Mike was actually up the road, but I rode through the front group on the first climb on my road bike. They're all on the TT bikes. But the, the sheer speed of the TT bike through the valley road, they were able to ride back, you know, and I'd rode minutes into them on the climb. And it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's you, you can afford to use a TT bike in 180K. 90K, maybe not. If it's just like the Nice World Champs the other year, up and down. But, um, Again, everyone will have their own view, but that's this is my opinion. TT bikes are always faster over the long stuff. Yeah, um, for sure. But yeah, it's, 
uh, where were we going with this one again? Sorry, man. Uh, I, no, you're right. I asked you, like, it originally started with me asking if it was an intrinsic oh, versus yeah, yeah, a yeah. data driven. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very intrinsic now. Like, yeah. Different. I, I, I prefer to feel I'm in, I'm executing it well, even running. That, that you feel for that turnover late where you're still, you're still driving through the knee. You know, it's not that the hips haven't sunk forward and your slow cadence, you're still able to turn over and, and a good thing is if you're able to go through an A station and respond <laughs> to to what you're doing with a drink, or and then it, you know maybe need to accelerate a little bit. That's a that's when you're actually running well. And then if you you go to let, let's <laughs> paint a dream scenario, you go to Kona, you 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 hit your race, you yeah. finish it, and you go that was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. Are you hanging it up or? Uh, or, or is that like a nah. false dichotomy where you're like, oh, I, I've got more in me and you want to keep going? Nah, not too. I, I don't want to put a time or a, you know, I would like to go, I, I would like to go to Cairns. I've been to Cairns so many times. It'd be nice to go there and actually just execute a race well. So that's another goal. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll just, yeah, I want to race well at home. Go and have a, a good race in Cairns, and then not not chase the Kona for qualification like I did for so long, you know. But if the opportunity presents, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll definitely be going there to to enjoy it a bit more. I carried a bit more intensity last year. I did get to see some cool stuff. I climbed both volcanoes um, on some training rides, and everyone's like, "Oh, that was the undoing of you." But they they were weeks before, and you know, they're only yeah. seven hour rides, so it's like. You know, I felt great. There was just something else going on. Um, so it's you know, I've always, I was always very fond of Hawaii. I thought it was a very different, different place and environment for a different athlete. But you know, the games also changed there. So coming back, you need to be a bit smarter as well um, mm -hmm. and be able to attack it at the right times. But you know, it's no good. I need to be able to use the four hundred watts. You know. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's no good just having them there and training. So. Um, yeah, I, if you had have asked me to 12 months ago, I probably would have said I'd have packed it up by now. But yeah, I'm I'm still here. I'm still swinging. And what are your th what are your thoughts about? Obviously, the Norwegians are just like mm. they're revolutionising the sport in terms of like what's what we think is possible. Like what, what what's your thought about the whole? I know we sort of touched on it earlier in terms of mm. you just need hard training, but they are so obviously they're training very hard, but they are just like it's almost like Ivan Drago and Rocky. You know, they're, they're made <laughs> in a lab. You know, what's yeah, your thoughts I, on the whole on on the whole Norwegian train? Yeah, I mean they they seem to go to these events in a week before or two weeks before they post this huge session, but around that there's not a lot like. Mm. It's all very hush hush. Yeah, they, just, so they, they drip feed what they want out. Yeah, there. <laughs> I know. So if you want to get caught into that, that's fine. But do, having a day where you do one session, that's just what we do. That's racing, right? You should be able to perform on a single day. So you know, and it's not like they're going around at four hundred watts for four hours and then running off the four by ten k. It's like so. I don't know. Yeah, it looks cool on paper. It looks cool on Strava, right? Um, and it definitely, you know, makes people talk and question what they're doing. But their approach, I think the whole approach they're taking with calorie, with nutrition, um, you know, what they're, the, the, the media they're feeding out there is making it look a lot more scientific. But every sash, session isn't in a lab. You know, it's all those ones where they're consistently jogging every day at home or wherever they are, just moving enough to keep the body efficient, keep it metabolizing correctly and then put the, put the real work in. Yes, Christian runs extremely quick, right? And that's developed over time. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's no joke. You, you win an Olympic medal, you're as, as good as it gets that year, right? So Yeah, of course. Um, and you put yourself in that situation, but you know, like, like Australia, and always a small country too. So it's like every country and, and location seems to have their time in the sun in some sport and it's it's what's needed to 
whether or not you want to say it is, is call it changing the sport or evolving the sport. Every sport and every industry goes through it. It's like, but we're in, we're in the triathlon bubble. We're in this endurance multi-sport bubble. So you see it, uh, it's in your face, right? Our, our sport is only driven by social media platforms. Okay. We don't, you don't flick on channel nine, channel seven, free to air. And there's, you know, there's a chat in the tube. No, no, it should do because it was really cool to watch. But, um, you know, and, and Max's approach is fantastic. You know, it's keeps to himself, puts the work in and his way. He's just the polar opposite. Like he hasn't posted oh. on in social media for like six months. You just don't hear from him. <laughs> he's, a good, he's a good bloke. I, you know, I've got a lot of, a lot of time for it, a lot of respect for it. And it's, you know, he, he is what he is, right? And he just enjoys mm. the training. He enjoys the sport, which you got to do to do the hours we need to, but you don't need to overcomplicate it. But mm. unfortunately, and I think for them, the majority, they see these big sessions, right? And a person's fitness or form isn't determined by a single session. Yeah. That's what you have to quickly look past. You know, you mm. pat them on the back. Yeah, great sesh. But when you, you know, as your own athlete, if you've been doing stuff like that every day for however long, it's like, yeah, you know, you can pat yourself on the back too. And that's what we're, we're our greatest critics, right, as individual athletes too, um, where it comes, especially when you don't have a lot of success, nothing is ever good enough. You could always push more watts. You could always run faster. But it also doesn't make you happy, right? You know, if you're unhappy and you're frustrated, usually it's it's just a, a downward spiral. Like, and I'm speaking from the, the real place, the right place. It's like you can get caught in your own world very quickly, and if you can't get out of your own way, you're going to be dictated to by what you see others doing, or be super smart and just don't even look. <laughs> you know, that's you can be. You can play that real naive game and yeah, you can promote yourself through the social media, but just not even pay attention to it. Um, you know, some people are fortunate enough to have people doing it for them, but you know, I think it's important to have some idea of how you've been promoted as a person. So you're not this different person when it, when you go on stage or you speak to a group or try and coach someone one day, you know, I'm not saying that's what I'm going to do post post sport, but there's always that opportunity, right? when you've spent so many years. I think it would be wasted if you didn't at least experiment with it just because you're, yeah. you're so knowledgeable on it and you just have all that experience. Yeah, and, and I came from that age group world as well. You mm. know, I was there to that's finish. The, that's the other big thing, yeah. You know, it's like a, ba- it's like a baby, right? And I can speak now because I've had, we've got one, a baby mm-hmm. and an old person, right? You start in diapers, pretty much you finish in diapers, right? Yeah. And it's like triathlon. I started with this just enjoyment of it. And I'm not saying I'm finishing, but in light of recent activities and how the last six months goes, enjoyment is what matters most in the day to day now. Mm. Like if I'm if I'm gonna go out and ride in the rain for six hours, you you need to enjoy that. Otherwise no one likes a miserable person at home. And yeah. And you just don't absorb what you're doing. It's like, you know, if weather's getting in your way, go on to the ergo or just think to yourself, race day could be like this. You know, it's like a... Yeah, it, it, it's very hard. It's a selfish sport, but you have to be selfless. You know, it's, it's like oxymoron, right? You know, you, you need to be able to, to let, let it go and not be so absorbed by, you know, what might be, oh, no, I don't need that much for dinner or, you know. I'm not saying go and eat heaps and and, and drink heaps of piss or anything like, anything like that. Hey, if it works for you, just keep doing it. But don't change your life too much. It's like because the sport is very stressful and very demanding and high stress. Mm. And I guess in my, mm. uh, to finish, in these last few weeks for me and I'm, and learning a whole new part of life and living, I guess it's mm-hmm. don't don't just look for 
people try and blame stuff if things aren't going right. Analyze what you've done, and if you can identify it, and it makes sense. Yes, but if you continually scratch your head, there are people out there who will help you. Mm. You know, there are a lot of there are people who dedicate their lives to correcting those injuries or that style of movement. So don't whinge because if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. No one's making you do no one's making you do sport. No one's making you be an accountant. No one's making you work at a coffee shop, right? There are other options. So it's like a Yeah, it's something my sister said to me when I first started, eh? Oh, God, I'd always be grumpy and yell out like I'm going to bed. Like, shut up. <laughs> You know, they're all, they're 20, like then they need to be quiet. And, uh, and she'd always be like, no one's, you know, if you don't enjoy it, no one's making you do it, don't do it. And then it's like, it only makes sense later on. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's, you know, it's so it's easy to say that. that but <laughs> yeah. That's it. Like you're, yeah. you are a high performer and mm. like, regardless of how, things have gone in just to get to where you are you're a, you're a high performer so it's all well and good for these people whether they're family or friends whoever who was mm. sitting on the lounge watching the footy <laughs> and you're like i got to get my fucking nine hours in <laughs> yeah. you know like it's just if they say it's something you only sort of you can only sort of laugh about it or ease mm. up about it later in life and you're like oh you know what it's a bit <laughs> it's all right you know I'll be fine. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that I'm not intense when I'm training. I'm intense. I, no, for sure. I'm there to do it. I'll have a joke when the time allows. But yeah, yeah, like the work needs to be done, regardless of how much fun you're having. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, being tired is is normal. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's a big, and that's what's hard when you do have maybe something like underlying with your body. It's so hard to identify because everything we're doing in this sport is creating that too. Makes you fatigued, makes you tired, everything aches. You know, you wake up in the morning, you, you shuffle out of bed. It's all very normal. But then there could be, you know, another storm brewing, I guess, you know, within you, within the, you as a person. It doesn't mean you're going to fall over the next day or, you know, it's not the, not the end of the world. It's just another something to look into, which could be, you know, you're trying to perform the best you can and whatever you're doing. So um, for me, it's now just you know, understand that don't, don't mm -hmm. use it. As, I'm not going to use it as an excuse, but it's an opportunity to be better. Yeah. Yeah. And then sort of carrying on from that, everyone will be super interested in terms of like, mm -hmm. you say you train for nearly 40 hours a week. Like mm -hmm. That is, that's a full-time job. Mm -hmm. 40 hours a week. Yep. What, what does a standard week look like? What mm -hmm. are you doing for your recovery? How are you? Because most people, they sure they go to work and that contributes, but if they're training sort of five or six hours a week, that's a big yep. week. Yep. You know, it's an astronomical difference. So what's yeah, the standard yeah, yeah. week look like? How are you recovering? Mm. Let's go through that. Well, I guess like by default, I was, my recovery, I always felt was, I was better when I was moving. Um, but it's because my body actually wanted that. So Mondays, I, I've swum at a squad now for 12 years here at home. So I, I swim squad in the mornings and then I run. Mondays are an easy day. I run 10K, um, you know, 50 minutes, very easy. And then sometimes I'd ride, but not in the winter. I have my son on Monday, so <laughs> it's a bit of a lighter day. And then uh, um, Tuesdays, yeah, I tend to uh, ride with some real TT or, or strength-based efforts. Um, that, that, that'd be sort of upwards of three hours, four hours. Uh, and then a run session of like tempo-based, so longer endurance work or build. And that could be up, you know, anywhere from 20 to, to 25K and then uh, just easy swim. That, that swim progresses closer to a race where it, it, it could be longer, but two to three K mm -hmm. and then swim long. So that's more like a it... race pace focus session. I yeah. can build, build into that. Yep. 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 And then swim long on, or, you know, full swim squad on 
on a Wednesday morning. It's five to six K and then ride an endurance tempo off the back of the day before. So that'll be like five, five to six hours, you know, so call it four to six in there, depending on the timing where I'm doing, you know, upwards of probably the lowest I would do would be three by 30 minutes in a heart rate zone, which typically would be race effort, 140 to 150 beats. Um, so I, I'm sort of there at home. I'm there like 350 watts in that zone. So it's pretty comfortable. Um, that's when I know I'm moving well as well. And then I'll just jog easy on a Wednesday night, uh, an hour. And then Thursday morning, um, I run long. So it's two to two and a half. I typically run long in the trail. I grew up at the base of the trails here in Perth, so it's quite hilly. I just like enjoy the, the there's no cars and it's very I love trail running, man. It's so much better. Yeah. And it's you know, you can make it hard, you can make it easier. Um if I need to up the tempo in the back half I will and try and build into mm-hmm. a long run. Um but yeah, that consumes that morning and then I tend to swim anywhere from two to three K after that, mainly just drills. And then I gym uh, with a physio in the afternoon and I spin either side of that. So I get like an hour or an hour and a half done, just more, more so recovery and then swim squat on Friday morning, just take it a bit easier, but still do five, four to five K. And then, uh, I usually still ride. I like to ride for 90 minutes to two hours on a Friday, even though it's, I guess a lighter day. Um, and then Saturdays, Saturday's changed, so they're either like a really hard run session in the morning, then two to three hours on the bike with um, some shorter tempo, like six to eight minutes at high RPM. I do a lot of different cadence work um, to uh, for efficiency in my pedal stroke as well as it's very good for recovery from uh, after a hard run session. So if I'm dropping from 50 RPM to 110, um, being able to ride very well at 110 to 120 RPM means you're very seated. You're very well settled in your position. Uh, that's So I've done a lot of some track cycling back in the day and learning to relax there was, was pretty important. Um, and then, yeah, swim for four or 5K in the afternoon. Or I ride early where I do some shorter, uh, I wouldn't call them endurance, but variable TT efforts. To 20 minute blocks or 15 minute blocks where I'm changing cadence and effort, um, almost VO2 based in some of it. So that ride would be four to five hours and then run off for an hour with some shorter interval fart leg work mm-hmm. and then still swim in the Arvo and then ride, ride long on a Sunday, it would be six. Um, so this is, you see, where I'm getting my volume, I'm sort of 20 hours on the bike in what yeah. I would say a normal week would be. And then towards a race, I would then start to run, depending on what the day before has been. If the day before wasn't a run off, I would run off that in mm-hmm. some form of longer. I would change that run. It would be about an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. depends on how long, how close to the race I'm getting or how key the session might become. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, or, but, or sometimes I'll just do the ride and then run in the afternoon, 10K. Yeah, uh, but that would be normal. Yeah, yeah. That's so. That's what I've done. I, and to be honest, it might change a little bit now, where I'm going to try and hit some bigger, some bigger days and not load so much two to three days in a row. But that would typically be what I've worked towards. Um, I've done a few really, a lot of good work towards Boston because I, I'll go down there and train, do a big session on a day, and then ride home the next day. So it's two fifty to home. Not with any effort, but when you ride in a flat, straight way for, you know, I've had headwinds where it's taken me eight hours, eight and a half hours. Um, But yeah, that's that just ultra aerobic zone one to two on on the day after quite a hard zone three uh, race day, I guess. Um, I was, I felt, you know, you know, when you gain from a session or from a, a training period. Yeah. And yeah, mentally and physically, that was very good. And then, so a lot of people hear that and just go like, what the fuck? Mm. Um, mm. And obviously we're not saying go out and copy that training week because you'll just get injured. 
Um, Absolutely. But, yeah. It's taken me a while. But, but, but. Yeah. <laughs> Most people, they're training somewhere between 15 and 25 hours a week, somewhere in that window. And yep. when they're doing recovery, like they've got Norma Tech boots, they're, mm. you know, getting massaged, they're doing all these everything they can just to survive their current training. Are you doing anything like that? Or are you just so conditioned and accustomed to it now that as long as you get your eight hours and good food, you're, you're right. No, I think it's why I love home so much. I have such a good team of medical professionals and from physios to a good friend who's an OT that can just assess some general movements to a physio that helps me strength and conditioning to a massage therapist. You know, it's, yeah, they know how I move probably better than me and how my tissue feels. Um, I really, I was really lucky a few years back, Black Roll, a German company who offer a, a full range of therapeutic instruments and devices. They reached out and I've been working with them since, but, you know, a lot of people are sponsored by companies that may not use the product, but all these, you know, from a foam roller, right, this, from their base product to, you know, their their massage gun and now their recovery boots and and all their bands. I'm very big on um, activations pre-sessions just to engage that right, whatever, you know, sling mechanism or uh, catch in the water or um, just to make sure you're not going to recruit something else in potentially a warm up or, um, you know, when it gets hard, if something's been turned on, you, that motor pattern will still be working because it should know what it's doing. Um, yeah. So that's, that's just part of life. That's what we, we have to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can ignore it, but it will catch up with you. Um, but yeah. Are you seeing these people weekly a yeah. couple of times a week? Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the heavier stuff, I might get massaged a couple of times a week, see a physio, mm -hmm. my physio once. Um, and I'm in the gym with my uh, with my physio as well. I, so I have a physio that looks over my, I guess, um, general health, muscle health, yep. who's helped me with a lot of the back. Over the years, helped me through a lot of stuff. And then I have a, a physio who's specific to my, I guess, strength and conditioning and my... Um, my movement patterns so you know he's fantastic in just watching the simple mat, uh, movements and then i have a, a good friend who's a, an ot so soft tissue who will just he's very aware very good with tendons so mm -hmm. just ten, tendon health super important right so um yeah it's it's constant care plan <laughs> yeah i yeah. think that's something that a lot of the training gets a lot of um, a lot of hype, and everyone wants to hear about yeah. the, big, the big training week. But the recovery—if you don't recover, you can't train. No, absolutely. And sleep's the most important. If anyone, <laughs> you know, if anyone takes anything from it, make sure don't let like treatment get in the way of sleep. Mm. You know, and even adding unnecessary gym sessions and stuff. Just be careful with uh, putting stuff in with extra loading. Mm -hmm. um, movement movement within the the swim bike run patterns is the most important so mm. yeah and that'll lead me into the final two questions i ask everyone mm -hmm. um one if there is one actionable step that you can give to if it's an age age grouper maybe someone who's trying to turn pro you, you can pick mm. what it's like that like what's something that they can take away either from the podcast or from the content mm -hmm. you put out that they can implement into into their life? Yeah. It's not about the intervals that you run. It's just about it. the time you achieve the time in every session. So it's purely about the consistency of showing up. Yeah. It's not, you, you don't get 35K into a marathon and think, gee, I wish I ran that 12, 400 in that interval session three months ago, it's you, all you do is think about, you know, wow, I'm glad I did all of those long runs. Yeah, yeah, just get it done. <laughs> yeah, just get the time done. If you're having a bad day, forget the efforts, do the time. Um, don't, don't ignore what accumulating consistency will do. Yeah. I think, I think that's so important. Like, people get so caught up of what it's going to look like on Strava and mm. things like that, rather than just being like, I am, I just need to accumulate the volume. 
yeah, Strava doesn't change you as an athlete, right? <laughs> yeah, massively. And then the last question, mate, um, I just always ask someone to recommend someone, in, if you could recommend someone in your network that I can I can interview next, something you think that people will benefit from talking to? In my network. Could be a physio, could be, a, yeah, yeah. Could be another athlete, could be whoever. Um, oh, wow. I've actually, I've just started working with this guy <laughs> who is, uh, is a bit of a social media influencer and he got challenged to do busso, right, by another okay. guy who's doing his first. This guy has no endurance base, right? So he might mm-hmm. be very good to talk to after busso. Okay. Right? He's just doing an Ironman, but I'm, he's asked me to work with him through till then. So oh, is this very... who you posted on your Instagram yeah. today? Yeah, so okay, I this is the this first morning. time we've caught up today, right? So it's, okay. it's, odd, it's odd because it feels like this is how I started. It was a dare. It was a challenge, right? Yep. And whereas mine wasn't an Ironman, his is. But he has, I had a bit of capacity. He has the most running training he's done is sprint training. So it's like... Perfect. He's ready. From zero. We're going from zero, yep. <laughs> zero to hero. But he's super yep. enthusiastic. So I don't know. I think post-event, he doesn't know what he's in for right now. But mm. so it's, you know, he doesn't need to talk to him right now. But yeah. Gerard I actually think is, it'd be quite cool to chat to him, get his ideas yeah. next. Maybe get his idea because I'm coming over for bus, so maybe we could chat right. to him a couple of weeks and, out before the race and then post race, just sort of get a full circle. Yeah, he he would be. Uh, you know, I could say I've got some really quality physios and therapists, hmm. but I think from a general audience, no, it's point interesting. Of view, yeah, it's yeah. different. It's very different. You know, sure. want to because it's not a bucket list for him, so it's not like he's been preparing for a long time. He's just like, mm. yeah, let's. He's got to learn. And develop an aerobic base in five months. Yeah, it's a it's a tall to, order. Because he doesn't want to walk. Yeah, because he doesn't want to walk. You know. Yeah. I, yeah. I did, but I did busso off off six months prep, so it can be done. Right. It can be done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he's got a busted knee at the moment, so we're already on the yeah, back foot. <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't <laughs> that doesn't help. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, Matty. Um, I appreciate your time, mate. Taking it out, right, but mate. um. It was an awesome chat. I think there's there's a whole bunch of different little nuggets yeah, in there that people will take away. We've been talking for ages, haven't we? Sorry, everyone. Hour and a half, mate. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> hey, good man. Awesome, mate. I'll I'll wrap All it right. up there. Cool. See you, buddy. Cheers. See you, mate. Bye.